Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and welcome to part 9 of our galactic-sized review slash overview slash how-to for Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition. In previous episodes, we've covered ship operations and then worlds and starports. So, building upon both of those, today we're going to cover passengers, freight, and trade. Woohoo! Ships taking on passengers or cargo, whether that be legal or illegal, is a staple of science fiction. Whether that be Star Wars with Han and Chewie's smuggling operation, or Firefly when they took on some passengers for some extra money. You forgot about the 1996 classic Space Truckers, starring Dennis Hopper and Steven Dorff as actual space truckers that are hauling pigs around the galaxy in a souped-up space rig. No, I didn't forget about Space Truckers no matter how much I want to. This chapter is short, only eight pages, but if your traveler group chooses to take on passengers or freight, it's going to be referred to a lot. So hopefully this video will help anybody just walk them through the rules. Now, before we do begin this long episode, one thing that I really want to stress is that all of this is completely optional. Uh, your players might just want to fly around the galaxy having adventures and punching aliens, and that is perfectly fine. But if they do want to start getting into the economies of these different worlds, or making a little extra cash on the side to cover all their ship's costs, or afford some you know, really cool gadgets and gizmos, this is a very viable option for them. We'll start with passengers. If your group is a ship with more staterooms than it has characters, there is some good money to be made from filling those rooms. Jack's scout ship has four staterooms. Not much, but if it's just him and one other crewman aboard, that gives him two empty rooms to fill. There are four levels of passengers. High passengers, as your luxury or first class passengers, they pay the most and expect the most. Each high passenger requires their own stateroom, plus one ton of cargo space for their belongings, and your ship must also be equipped with a steward to take care of them. For each level of steward on your ship, you can attend to 10 high passengers. Jack has no steward, meaning that either he can't take on high passengers, or that he would need to hire a ship steward as among his crew. Next comes middle passengers. This is your standard class. Each middle passenger requires their own room, and is allotted 100 kilos of cargo space. A steward can attend to 100 middle passengers for each level that they have, while a steward of level 0 can still manage 10 middle passengers. Again, because Jack lacks the steward skill altogether, he would need to hire one among his crew, or be trained in steward at some point in the future, that way he could take them on. Next is basic passengers. This is your steerage or your economy class, with everybody packed in as tight as they can go. Basic passengers are each allowed 10 kilos of luggage, and can fit four to a stateroom. Or, if there's no more staterooms available, and you're just erecting cots inside your ship's holder somewhere, each passenger requires two tons of ship space. Finally, we have low passengers. This is when passengers are frozen in freezer berths, then thawed out upon arrival. This, of course, requires their ship be equipped with low berths, and passengers are allowed up to 10 kilos of luggage space. However, low passage is dangerous to do, and when they're thawed, a medic must make a roll to resuscitate them using the passenger's endurance DM as a modifier. If they fail that roll, the passenger dies. Of course, higher technology ships can lessen this chance, and many ships enact sort of a morbid lottery, where all the passengers vote to see how many low passengers survive the journey. Jack's ship is equipped with no low berths, meaning that he couldn't take on low passengers. So without those, and no ship steward aboard his ship, he's going to be limited to only basic passengers if he was to take them on. Passengers pay for their trip on a per-jump basis. So we have this chart showing at how much it costs per jump traveled at whatever level passenger they are. So a basic passenger making a one parsec jump would pay 2200 credits. Now, since Jack's ship can do jump 2, the same passenger would pay 2,900 credits if they were to do a single 2-parsec jump. Meanwhile, a high passenger would pay 12,000 credits for a single 2-parsec jump. Of course, if a journey requires the multiple jumps, such as you're traveling 4 parsecs and you're in a jump 2 ship, then the journey would cost 2 jump 2 tickets in order to do it. So now that we know what passengers pay, let's discuss how you find passengers. Acquiring passengers can take a few steps and may involve various skills, either broker, streetwise, or corrals. 
I see Broker as more like selling legitimate tickets online or through a starport, kind of like Captain Kirk did that one time. While Streetwise and Corrals is mostly hanging out at parties or CD bars, selling rides to whoever you can. Jack is level one in all three of these skills, so he can use whichever one that he wants to equally well. Next, we add the passenger modifiers from this table. This table takes into account various things, such as if you have a cheap steward, or making it harder to find high-paying high passengers while easier to find low-paying low passengers. Now one thing that has caused some confusion, while the size of the world and the starport do make a difference on here, it doesn't specify which one of those you're supposed to use, the origin point where you're picking the passengers up, or the destination point that you're taking the passengers to. And after a little bit of hunting around, I discovered that the answer to that is both. So if you were to look for passengers at a class B starport on a seven population world, you get a plus two. But if you're then heading to a crappy E-class starport in a red zone, that reduces it all down to a DM-3. This represents that while well, yes, if you are at a huge starport with hundreds, even thousands of people at it, you are going to have a good chance of finding passengers, but you're not going to find as many passengers that want to go to a, a crappy location that's not as desirable to go to. This is a lot more like real life. If you were to go to some big international airport in New York or something, and do a poll to see where everybody wanted to go, you'd get a lot more people saying that they wanted to go to Paris, France, than to some municipal airport in nowhere North Dakota. Of course, game masters can and they should add their own modifiers, depending on the specifics of whatever the game or the campaign is, uh, considering political climates in that region, or just to make things interesting for you know a different adventure sort of thing. Uh, like hundreds of refugees are fleeing a particular world, and now there's a surplus of passengers needing a ride out of here. Once we have all our modifiers and have made our skill roll, whatever the effect comes to for that roll, we then consult the passenger traffic table to see how many of these passengers we find. So if we had a total effect of 3, we find 1d6 passengers. If our effect was 8, we find 3d6 passengers. We then go through this process for each of the four different levels of passengers if we're looking for them, meaning that we might roll four skill checks if we're looking for all four types, from you know, high passengers to low passengers. Now, since Jack can only take on basic passengers right now, he's only going to do this once, just for basic passengers. However, that could still be a lot of skill rolls that your players have to do, and that could take up a lot of time if they are looking for all four levels. So, just as a house rule, in order to speed that up, game masters might want to call for just a single skill roll in order to find passengers, and then the modifiers come into effect are different for high passage or low passage, so you, then you just apply those modifiers for which particular type of passenger they're looking for, but you just roll once, apply the modifiers for those different levels, and see what type of passengers you find. Like I said, this is just a house rule, but you can cut four rolls down to one, so it might be a nice way to speed up your sessions. Of course, bringing strangers onto your ship can lead to some interesting situations. The book gives us a random passenger list to see if we have any interesting passengers aboard, from expectant mother, to a complaining noble, to a pirate that's planning and hijacking your ship. The rules suggest that you don't use this every single time the travelers take on passengers, they shouldn't always be exciting or problematic, and of course, there's a lot of different options that you could add yourself for plot reasons. Some other things that you might want to take into account as groups. A married couple that's flying middle passage, they're probably not going to be taking two separate rooms. They're probably going to be taking one room, leaving another room available for you to sell. A wealthy high passenger might also come with an entourage of servants, requiring basic or middle passage rooms in order to take care of their boss. Alien passengers might also have special needs, such as Aslan can't eat normal food without an enzyme to help them digest it. While Kukri are these huge centaur-like aliens and might require special accommodations because they can't fit in your standard shower stall or narrow passages might be problematic for them. And that's before we even begin all the cultural issues we could have with the various alien species that hopefully your ship steward is skilled enough to navigate through those. That's why I like low passengers. Meat popsicles do not complain. The High Guard book gives us several ship options, such as larger and fancier high or luxury staterooms, that give a bonus if you're looking for high passengers and might want to take advantage of your jacuzzi tubs and plush carpets. Now let's look at freight, cargo the travelers might take with them when they're traveling port to port. Jack's ship is a small 12-ton hold. Nothing really when compared to the spacious 82-ton hull that a free trader has, but still enough to make some extra cash hauling freight around. Freight comes in three sizes. 
major, which is 10 to 60 ton lots, minor, which is 5 to 30 ton lots, and incidental coming in at 1 to 6 ton lots. While a traveler can choose how many lots they wish to take, lots cannot be divided into smaller sizes like half lots or anything. So with Jack's 12 ton hold, if he was to find some major cargo and each lot of that was 20 tons, he wouldn't be able to take any of that cargo because his ship's hold isn't big enough to take all 20 tons at once. How we find freight is much the same way that we find passengers. First, we use either the broker or the streetwise skill. Broker for normal goods, while streetwise is for finding shadier and less than legal cargoes. Next, we add any freight modifiers to this role. This chart gives us various factors, such as it being easier to find small incidental cargo over large major cargo, or if we're using a large or small starport in order to find it. And like with passengers, we use both the modifiers for our start and destination point. So if we're picking up cargo at a Class A starport, then going to another Class A starport, that would give us a total of a plus four. Once we've made the skill roll and applied all the appropriate modifiers, we then compare the effect to the freight traffic table. This tells us how many lots are available to transport. So if we succeeded our broker roll with an effect of 4, there are 2D lots available. Or if we succeeded it with a 7 effect, we have 3D lots available. The rules say to repeat these steps for each type of cargo, essentially making three broker or three streetwise rolls. Again, just for the sake of speeding this up, and because there's already modifiers in place if it's going to be incidental or major cargo, game masters might want to change this to being just a single skill roll. Just apply the different modifiers for each type of cargo, cutting three skill rolls down to one. Payment for freight is determined the same way that it is for passengers. The price is per ton shipped, and the jump distance for individual jumps. So one ton of cargo traveling at jump 1 is 1,000 credits, while well, jump 2 is 1,600. If a cargo requires multiple jumps, such as we're going 3 parsecs and Jack's jump 2 ship, it'll cost 2,600 a ton and take 2 weeks. Meanwhile, a faster jump 3 capable ship could do this in 1 week with a single jump for 3,000 credits a ton. While passengers pay before they board the ship, freight is paid to the travelers upon delivery of the goods. And if they deliver late for some reason, like a missed jump or a wild adventure along the way, the payment could be reduced, meaning that the goods might no longer be needed or maybe they've spoiled before they could arrive. Which means that not only do you not get paid because you delivered late, but now you gotta deal with 10 tons with a spoiled milk in your ship's hold. And that smell lingers. Now one thing that's not stated in the core book is how this freight is stored. Though JTAS Volume 1 mentions 1, 5, and 10 ton standardized storage containers, so I imagine that you're going to find a lot of your freight being transported in these goods, uh, probably with tamper-proof seals on them to make sure that nobody opens them up and checks them out, maybe takes something for themselves. They might be airtight, they might be refrigerated, or they might be heated, they might be ventilated for having live animals inside of them, or your freight Freight could really just be loose bags of grain or something like that. So game masters, you're going to want to decide you know, that information as to what sort of form this freight is whenever the travelers are taking it on in case they ask. What if I decide just to steal my ship's cargo? I mean, they loaded it on my ship and everything. Why don't I just run away with it and sell it all myself? If the travelers decide to steal their freight cargo, they can. Game masters will definitely need to figure out what that freight is if the travelers decide to open it up and ask what it is and keep it for themselves, and they can use the trade goods table for that, and we'll talk about that later on. It might be machine parts or valuable equipment, 20 tons of toilet paper, or thousands of plastic bobble-headed geisha doll toys. However, any merchant that's loading their goods on the traveler's ship, you know, they're going to know whose ship it was that they loaded it onto, and they're probably going to have a signed manifest or a bill that they transferred it over. So the player characters, if they decide to steal the cargo and keep it for themselves, they should expect to encounter some bounty hunters later on, or maybe their transponder ID is flagged at any Class A or Class B starport with impound owner or orders or lien notices, uh, and they might find future freight harder to get as word starts getting around that these guys are stealing freight. You know, it's kind of like likely a space yelp or something like that, and terrible reviews or reputation might cause banes or other minuses to start popping up whenever the travelers are trying to find freight again in the future. Next is mail. While ex-boats carry mail along set pass through chartered space, some mail then gets sent to neighboring systems that are away from those ex-boat stops, or it's not trusted to 
the X-boats for whatever reason. And getting tasked to be able to transport mail, that can be pretty lucrative. To find any mail available to transport, the travelers simply roll 2d6. They then add any applicable modifiers from the mail table. The mail table, though, is a bit odd. It first references the regular freight modifiers that we looked at for regular freight, so now we have to go back here, plug in all the applicable modifiers to get the total freight traffic DM, and then once you have that, you then go back to the mail table to compare it to this, which translates to anywhere between a minus two to a plus two. It then goes on to take into account other factors, such as the ship being armed or the highest rank of Navy or Scout that the travelers had. Since Jack was a rank one scout during character creation, that means he gets a plus one when he's trying to find mail jobs. Once you have all those modifiers, you simply add those to a 2d6 roll, and if you get a 12 or more, there is mail that's available to carry. Next, you simply roll 1d6 to see how many mail lots are available. Each lot is a standardized 5-ton container, and all the available lots must be taken in order to get the job. So if we roll and say there's 6 lots, and each of those lots is 5 tons apiece, that comes to 30 tons that you're carrying, if you can't carry all 30 tons at the same time, then you're not allowed to carry any of that available mail. Payment is a flat 25,000 credits per container, meaning that if you've got four containers, that comes to 20 tons of cargo, bringing you 100,000 credits, which is awesome. Mail pays a flat rate, so the distance isn't going to be a factor in this. It pays the same where you're traveling one parsec or five. Finally, let's look at speculative trading. Unlike freight, where the travelers are hauling other people's goods, like DHL or something, speculative trading is a lot riskier because the travelers own this cargo with the intention of selling it. You know, the buy low and sell high method. This is how many ship captains of old would be, you know, they'd sail into a port, buy several tons of goods that they had there, then sail off to somewhere else where those goods might be in demand. This type of trading requires that the travelers have the upfront capital in order to purchase these goods, followed by the risk that they might not be able to sell them for enough to cover all their costs and be able to make enough profit to make it worth it. The reward, though, is that with the right strategy and with the right roles, it can be extremely profitable. The checklist for speculative trading is seven steps. First, we find a supplier to sell us the goods. Finding a supplier can be done in several ways. If you're looking for regular legal goods, it's simply a broker check of eight or more, using your education or social DMs and takes 1d6 days. If you're looking to check the black market for illegal goods, it's a streetwise check of eight or more, using your education or social dice modifiers, and also takes 1d6 days. Or you could do all this online, searching the net. This requires that at least on a tech level 8 world or higher, and for that you perform an admin check of 8 or more using your education dice modifier, and that takes 1d6 hours. Of course, several modifiers can be added to this. The size of the starport you're at can make a huge difference. You can also hire a local broker to help you find a supplier. The broker will charge you a fee based off their own level of broker and the legality of the goods that they're trying to broker with you. Of course, travelers might try to shop around and find multiple suppliers, you know, trying to find the best rate available in order to purchase these goods. That's perfectly fine to do. It's just that each successive attempt after the first receives a minus one dice modifier if this is performed in the same month. Okay, so we found a supplier, either legal or illegal, through a broker or whatnot. The next step is we determine what goods the supplier has available to sell. There are two types of goods. Common goods, which are available on any world, and trade goods. These are only common on the worlds with the corresponding trade code. You remember trade codes, right? We talked about those in the last video. They're these little abbreviations that you see on a subsector map. Each two-letter abbreviation means that some aspect or combination in that planet's universal world profile, such as trade code RI means rich because it meets these qualifiers in atmosphere, population, and government. Now, in the last video, I mentioned the trade code HT didn't appear on the example for the planet's profile we were doing. Evidently, that is an issue that many of the trade codes have where they don't show high-tech or low-tech worlds on the sector profile, so be sure to double-check the UWPs to see if a planet should have an HT or an LT code. A supplier will have all the common goods as well as all the trade goods for their planet's trade code, and then 1D6 randomly determined goods available for purchase. So what that means is we then have to check this giant two-page table that has 36 types of goods on it. The first six are our common goods, which are available anywhere. 
we then find the goods for whatever our supplier's planet's trade code is. So let's say, for example, we're on an agricultural planet looking to purchase some cargo. That means that our supplier has all the goods that are available for an agricultural planet, which is these. However, items 61 through 65 are illegal goods. So unless a supplier is a black market supplier, we're not going to have access to these illegal biochemicals and illegal luxury items. But if we are using a black market supplier, then we're automatically going to have access to these if we're on an agricultural world. Next, we roll 1d6 for random other goods, excluding any legal goods unless we're using black market, of course. So let's say that we roll and we get a 2. I then roll to see what the extra goods that my supplier has, and I've got robots and live animals. Now my supplier already had live animals, but in the case of multiples like this, this means that my supplier now has more than normal. So instead of 1d6 times 10 tons of animals, they have 2d6 times 10 tons of animals. Okay, so we know what our supplier has available for us. The next step is we determine what our purchase price is. To do this, we roll 3d6 and add the following dice modifiers. We add the level of broker, either the travelers or the level of the broker that we hired to do this for us. We add any dice modifiers from the purchase DM column for that good. We subtract any dice modifiers from the sale DM column. And then we subtract any DMs for this supplier, such as they're really powerful or anything else the Game Master decides for them. And as a note, if we have multiple modifiers in either the purchase or sale DM fields, we only use the highest one. Okay, so let's get back to our available goods here. For the purpose of this example, let's just look at robots and textiles. So starting with the purchase DMs, robots has a DM plus one for industrial worlds, which I'm not on, so we can ignore that. Textiles gives us a plus seven for being on an agricultural world, which we are on, so we get a plus seven to our purchase roll. That is pretty nice. Now we subtract sales DMs. So with robots, there's a minus two for being on an agricultural world because they're in high demand on this planet, which means they're less likely to be for sale. So that gives us a minus two when we're rolling the purchase price for them. Now there's also a dice modifier for high technology. Since we're not on a high tech world, this doesn't matter. But if let's say that the planet that we were looking to buy these robots on was both agricultural and high tech, then we would only use the highest one, which is gonna be that minus two for agriculture, but we're not going to stack them together. Now for textiles. It is a dice modifier for both high population and for non-agricultural worlds. Neither of those apply for us since we are on an agricultural world, so we can strike both of those out. Okay, so that leaves us with a minus two dice modifier for buying these robots and a plus seven modifier for purchasing these textiles. Now that we know what our DMs are, the next thing we do is we total these up with a 3d6 roll and compare the results in the modified price table. Okay, so starting with the robots, we roll our three dice and get a 13. Then we add a plus one for Jack's broker skill level, but subtract up minus two. That gives us a 12. Checking the table, at a 12, we can purchase those robots for 80% of their regular value. That is a good discount. Robots are normally 400,000 credits a ton, and 80% means that we could pick these up for 320,000 credits a ton. But Jack doesn't want to risk this in case he can't sell them all for a good price, so he's going to pass on these. Next, Jack looks at the textiles. He rolls his 3d6 and gets a 9. Not that great. We then add the plus one for his broker skill level, and then that plus seven purchase DM, because we are on an agricultural world, that gives us a 17. Checking the chart, we can get these textiles for 55% of their standard price, and that is pretty nice. So going back to the textiles description, the regular price is 3,000 credits a ton. Taking that and adjusting it for our 55%, we can pick these up for $16.50 a ton. What's available for sale is 1d6 times 20 tons, so rolling the dice, we get a 4, which times 20 gives us 80 tons available to purchase. Unfortunately, Jack's tiny scout ship can only carry 12 tons of cargo, so at $16.50 a ton, Jack could fill his old for 19,800 credits. Step four is purchase goods. So Jack buys these textiles with the money that he got from his last job. Step five is we travel to another planet. Now Jack knows that he shouldn't try to sell these textiles on another agricultural world because there's no demand for them there, so he jumps to a high population world nearby. We then move to step six, finding a buyer. This step works exactly like finding a supplier did in step one. 
We can use broker for legal goods, streetwise for illegal, and admin for online sales. The starport size makes a difference, and we can also hire a broker to do this for us if we personally lack that skill ourselves. We're allowed to shop for multiple buyers, but suffer a minus one for each previous attempt made in the same month. This is exactly the same process that we encountered in step one. Last is step seven, determining a sale price. This is almost, but not exactly the same as step three was when we were determining a purchase price, we roll 3d6 and apply the following modifiers. We add the level of broker who's working the deal, which is either going to be our level or the broker that we hired, but then we subtract any applicable DM from the purchase DM column. Next, we add any applicable DM from the sale DM column. So those two were reversed from how we did them when we did step three. We then subtract any modifiers for the buyer, such as their own influence or whatever their own broker skill level is or whatever it is the game master desires. And as before, if we have multiple purchase or sale DMs from those columns that come up, we only use the highest one. Looking at our textiles here, we first subtract any purchase DMs. The only one there is that plus seven agricultural, and we intentionally avoided coming to an agricultural world again for this reason, so we can ignore that one. Next, we add any sale DMs. We have two here, high population and not agricultural. Jack was smart, and he intentionally came to a high population world to sell these goods, so he does get that one, while the non-agricultural one doesn't apply, so we just ignore it. Once again, if both of those applied, such as we're on a high population, non-ag world, we would still only use the largest of those DMs. Next, we total the result of our DMs and add a die roll and compare them to the modified price table. This time we'll be looking at the sale price column. So we roll our 3d6 and get an 11. Not terrible, but not great. We then add our level of broker, which is 1, and then add that plus 3 because this is a high population world. That gives us a total of 15. Checking the table, at 15 we can sell these goods for 120% their normal price. Again, textiles normally sell for 3,000 a ton, so 120% of that comes to a sale price of 3,600 credits a ton. Jack has 12 tons of these, so he can unload all of these textiles for 43,200 credits. Now, we bought these textiles for 19,800 credits, meaning that the profit of this sale would be 23,400 credits, more than doubling his initial investment. Now, Jack can decide at this point if he does want to sell his cargo for this amount, or maybe try his luck by getting a different buyer or something like that, but he decides to go ahead and sell them now because this example has already gone on long enough. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of speculative trading, and it also comes with a serious risk, but a very high potential for reward. But even in that example that I gave, because textiles only start at 3,000 credits a ton, Jack really didn't make much more money off of this than he would have made if he had just filled up his 12-ton cargo hold carrying freight around. Now, if he had been able to get a lower purchase price or get a higher selling price or gotten that profit margin when selling something as expensive as those 400,000 credits a ton robots, then that would have been very different and he would have made a lot more money. Or if I just pirated that cargo and sold it all myself. Zero cost, pure profit. Speculative trading is interesting, and some players out there love this aspect to the game, uh, giving the opportunity to build an entire shipping empire for their characters. The book even says that there is a planned Merchant Prince book to give us even more details about how to do that. And we didn't even get into illegal goods in this video, which can add even more aspects to it, where we to smuggle weapons or contraband out on the black market. Now, full disclosure here, my players have never attempted speculative trading in any of our games. They'll haul freight and passengers around, or they'll try to get mail and haul that whenever they can, but they don't find the risk or the time required to do speculative trading to be worth it for them, so it's definitely not for everybody out there, but I like that it is out there in case any players want to try their hand at it. As I said in the beginning of this video, freight and passengers and trade is all completely optional. If your players don't want to spend their game time, you know, hauling cargo or passengers or trying to negotiate sale prices if they're trying to do trade, and they don't want to do math. Instead, they want to be flying around the galaxy, blowing up aliens and collecting bounties on criminals, then that is perfectly fine for them to do that instead. Yeah, I signed up to do this game for daring heroics, not, uh, economics. Traveler gives us options for all of those things, and it's part of what makes this such a great system to do a good sandbox sci-fi universe with, because we have so many ample possibilities as far as what we can do. 
Personally, I think that the freight and the passenger options are fantastically smooth and giving the players a quick way to gain a little bit of cash and also cover whatever their ship's costs are. And if you're flying from one system to another in order to have an adventure there, and you've got room in your cargo hold or you've got a few extra bedrooms available, why not go ahead and fill those up for a quick, easy 50,000 credits just while you're going? Yeah, it is kind of nice when the ship does pay for itself. That way the money that we get for jobs ain't as critical. Sometimes the money that my group makes just traveling to an adventure ends up being more money than they made doing the actual adventure itself. My biggest complaint though with this entire section of the book is that while yes, it is only eight pages long, they are very eight dense pages long, with a only single example that's given, and that only covers a small portion of speculative trading. I'd have loved some examples to help walk us through the process of freight and passengers, which means that the learning curve for us was pretty steep before we managed to get this down. So hopefully this video does help players or prospective players out there you know, understand this a bit easier, kind of help develop a good foundation as far as how the rules work. Now everything that we've gone over so far, this is all just from the core book, but we can find some additional information on smuggling in JTAS Volume 1, and some additional information on speculative trading in JTAS Volume 4. Game masters can use cargo or passengers to give different story seeds in their adventures. You know, a down on her luck merchant might give them a great deal on some goods in order to sell them somewhere, which then sends them off to a particular planet where there's going to be an adventure waiting for them or a random passenger on their ship is able to provide a good story seed for them and it leads to another exciting adventure. So game masters can use all of this as ways to push the player characters toward a certain planet or toward a certain city where they have an adventure waiting for them. Or you can have it where the passengers of cargo ain't quite what the travelers thought it was. Then shortly after they're in the jump space, some monster gets out of a crate or something and gets in the air ducts of the ship. And then the whole adventure is just them trying to get this monster off their ship before it kills everybody. Okay, that is it for this episode. Hopefully it answered a few questions that new players might have about the game, or maybe some experienced players might still have about the game. The next episode in this series will be the last in this core book series that I'm doing, and it's going to cover just some various house rules or suggestions, a couple corrections, or just a few other things that weren't able to fit in anywhere else. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews or RPG philosophy, just hit that subscribe button. And if you want to support this channel, Seth's got plenty of novels and audiobooks that you could pick up, and Christmas is right around the corner. Till next time, travelers, you have a great day. You know, your example of me was completely wrong. No way would I buy 12 tons worth of towels or t-shirts or whatever the hell that was when it could have been robots. I will always go for the robot.